Stone Groove Records and Stone Grooves and Deep Cuts Radio Show. There you go. Drog, as I always say. Um, yeah, so uh, this is part two. No, not really part two, but episode two of Hard and Heavy 80s, 1981. Another epic year for uh, heavy metal. I mean, we, uh, this is going to be a two-parter. There's no way we can... It's, it's going to be huge. Yeah, we couldn't squeeze out anything. Um, <laughs> actually, we did end up squeezing out a few. Um, that should have been included, like uh, Venom, Welcome to Hell. You won't notice. Uh, <laughs> didn't, didn't include Venom, Welcome to Hell. Um, reason being, I forgot to bring it, and he didn't have it. I just didn't have it. So we're gonna um, talk about it, though, right? Right, right now. Oh, right now. I um, mean, yeah, Venom. Oh, Venom, Welcome to Hell. Welcome to hell. I mean, it's uh, 81, really? 81. I'm pretty yes. sure. Yeah. I remember yeah. when I first saw it, it was like 83, and I was freaked out by it because I was like, what the hell? Satan, Satan, Satan. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I will never listen to those guys. <laughs> Famous last words. Yeah, it's, but I mean, but I was fascinated by it at the same time. They're another one of those new wave of British heavy metal bands that had that raw edge. And I mean, they, oh, yeah. really, they, the, I mean, musicianship, they sucked. Oh, yeah, but they. But that's what was awesome about them. <laughs> it was they, raw. They, it, was, it was like metal. It was like the punk vibe in metal. It just was pure. Raw emotion, aggression, energy, but not so aggressive. I mean, you know, the the people that came after took it to the friggin' nth degree, right? And it's like aggro, aggro, aggro. Venom still had a sense of humor, right? I guess it's the I agree. part. Yep. And I think you know, integral to the development of the whole thrash metal scene. Thrash sure. metal, and I know people also accuse them <laughs> of being the you know the first black metal band, but uh, yeah. What they, what they call black metal now, and what they, and what they, you know, Venom called black metal? Yeah, it didn't really exist. Not the same then. thing. Just not the same thing. So. I mean, black metal was a play on black magic, and they it was the most satanic band at the time. And, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I think, whatever. All right, so we're gonna get right into it. Here we go. Uh, top uh, fifty. <laughs> top fifty. <laughs> seriously? I don't know. We didn't. Wow. We I, we didn't count. This is some good stuff. It's probably at least thirty records. So why is there a square on the face? We'll go. We'll go through them. It's focusing on you. Why isn't it focusing on you? I don't know. <laughs> I've got a square around my face. You can't see it. But I can see anyway, it. go ahead. Okay, so not that it's the bottom of the barrel, but the first one we're showing is oh. ACDC for those about to rock. Oh, yeah, great album. <laughs> yep. Great. Um, great album. Not, of course, the title track is legendary, oh, yeah. epic. It's, it's one of their, you know, signature songs. You probably. It's one they probably played every concert ever since this album came out. A little personal story on this one. My buddy, Chris Alanek, my heavy metal buddy that we grew up together, got this when it first came out, total ACDC freak. The, the, the title track kept skipping. He went through like five of them, everyone skipped. And then we realized, oh, it's his needle. <laughs> <laughs> kept bringing it back down, bringing a new one back home. Oh my god, it skips too. We finally figured it out. Great album, though. Yeah, <laughs> and it's not just one song, though. No. Walk, uh, walk, what, what, Evil Walks, COD, what else is on here? I love Evil Walks, that's a great one. Injected, Scalebound is an awesome one. Injected, Injected Venom. Venom. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Snowball. Yeah. Uh, is this maybe not as, not quite as strong as Back in Black, or commercially successful, but still, it's pretty damn close. But really, how do you follow Back in Black? You know. so, yeah. it, it is a gatefold. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. that. That's killer. So, ah. Moving on, otherwise this will be, you know, forever. a mini-series. <laughs> right. So, Alright, so 1981, one of my favorites, personally, Jews Priest, Point of Entry. Uh, much more accessible, a uh, little bit more pop-oriented, as much as pop applies to Priest, yep. than British Steel was, but great songwriting on this one, uh, heading off to the highway. Uh, all-time favorite songs. Of course, you got the the uh, "Where We Live" song, the "Desert Plains." Desert Plains, yep. don't go, hot rock and turning rockin'. circles. Love that one. Great album. Um, yeah. UK cover, US cover. I've always liked the UK cover better. Maybe that's because they're from the US. Who? Huh? 
I said I always liked the UK because well they are from the they're not from the US they're from the UK. Yeah, no, the band is. The band's not from the US. What are you talking about? <laughs> hey, why is there a square in my face? <laughs> Were you joking? <laughs> I like the UK cover better. Because maybe the band is from the UK. And, yeah, and because I'm from the US, maybe that's why. Because I've heard people from the UK oh, say okay. they like the American cover better, but I don't. The American cover is stupid. Kind of. <laughs> it's, it's simple. Yeah. It's got, you can see yourself in both sides. It's very dated. It very dates itself because of what's it on It kind of is. Yeah, it's a dot matrix, dot matrix paper. paper. Yeah. True. But still, sorry. Pretty cool. We <laughs> lost it there. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next up, oh boy, Van Halen. Yep. Women and Children first. Oh man, uh, oh, I'm sorry. And do over. Uh, fair, fair warning. Fair warning. <laughs> <laughs> I think the Mets are wearing off. <laughs> yes. Fair warning. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna try. Fair warning. <laughs> All right. So wait, now. heavy record. I oh, mean, yeah. I, I hear people I'm arguing all the time. You know, Van Halen, not heavy metal. Alright, maybe not, but you know what? Prototypical early 80s heavy metal right here. <clears throat> yep. Heavy guitar tones. And that down that down tune D on Unchanged. Just like, uh, uh, yeah. Main Streets. Main <clears throat> Streets, great song. Hey, game Changers, Eddie Van Halen. Yeah. David Lee Roth, I mean, they, and David Lee Roth was a showman. Oh, totally. I mean, how many how many bands tried to try to copy, copy him? Oh yeah, of and course, he was just copying Jim Dandy, hey, Jim Dandy from Black Hole Arkansas, thing, yep. and just took it to the took next level. Took it to the next level. Yep, the showman all so. the way through, man. Yep. Um, all right, <clears throat> we've got another double shot when bands used to work really hard, although that's not necessarily true in this case. Tigers of Pantang, new wave British heavy metal band. We had Spellbound was their second full length. Crazy Nice is their third, third full length. Uh, yep. Both featuring John Sykes on lead guitar. Yes. Uh, this is the first appearance of Sykes. Yep. And also the first appearance of John Deverell on this one, the new yep. singer who replaced Jess Cox. Much more melodic sensibilities on this one. And I wonder if that's just the vocals, but I think the music was more melodic. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think so too. And I think that might have been Sykes' influence. Yeah, definitely. Uh, cover up by Rodney Matthews. Rodney Matthews. On Not Rodney Matthews, but man. Matthews. Pretty, pretty damn close. Pretty darn close. <laughs> So, so great albums, really. A good. This one was kind of rushed, maybe not quite as well thought through as this one, but still, yeah. good sound, great band. It's kind of like Saxon Denim and Leather. I mean, uh, yeah, Wheels of Steel and uh, Strong Arm Strong Arm They kind of go together. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So we really do. All right. Next, up next, the Purple Mach Three. I mean, White Snake. Yes. Uh, come and get it. We had uh, three of the you know five members of Deep Purple Mach Three on here. Dave Coverdale, John Lord, and Ian Pace. There you go. And then we've got, uh, what, we got Bernie Marzine and uh, Mickey Moody. Yeah, great oh, guitar. Bluesy guitar players. Bluesy, heavy, first wave mm. of British heavy metal, hard rock, whatever. You know what? It's just heavy rock from the UK. Yeah, <laughs> good stuff. Uh, I actually... This is not your your high school white snake. This was the previous to all that big success they had in the late 80s. Yeah, this is, this is not hair band white snake. No. This um, is very bluesy, very bluesy, still very rooted in 70s classic yep. rock white snake. Very good stuff. I really enjoy yeah. it, so... My snake, let me get it. All right, next, 1981, one of my favorites from this year. Blue Oyster Cult, Fire of Unknown Origin. One of my favorites oh, as well. Oh my god, what a great album. I ate that album up when I was in high school. There's not a bad song on here, really. Um, my favorite, my personal favorite, Veteran of the Psychic War. Yes! One awesome of my all time song. favorite songs, hands down. Something about that song just resonates with me. Very, big time. very spooky kind of song to me. That's, it is, yeah. written by Michael Moorcock, the yeah, there you go. Ulrich writer. Yep. Very, um, very, very, very biographical of Elric. Yep. Not the first time they worked with him. Excellent cover art, too. I always thought this was a fantastic cover. A um, couple hits on this one. Oh, yeah. We had uh, Burning For You. Burning For You was a huge hit. hit. Yep. Uh, what else did we have? Is, uh, uh, wasn't that... Um, come on. What's the other one? Uh, I can't. <laughs> um, was a veteran of the Psychic Wars. Was no, on the heavy metal soundtrack. Was, Soul Survivor? Um, Joe Crawford. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah John Crawford, Crawford. Great song. Yep. So. There's just such a depth to this album that some of their albums were kind of hit and miss at places, but yeah, this one really came together, and I'm surprised it wasn't bigger. Than it, 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 I remember it being really big when I was in high school, but yeah, it's kind of forgotten now for some reason. That's a great album. It's so. still one of my favorites from DLC. And, uh, you know, it's you're, we've got the, the Kronos Cross on there, obviously. The, this must be the Blue Oyster Cult here, with all these Druid-type people. I remember sitting in a church for a couple hours, a Baptist church I got tricked to go into when I was Oh, like, one of those lock things? Oh, uh, yeah. A friend's, a friend's mother, a friend of a friend's mother said, Oh, come, 
come to church and they're talking about music. And me and my buddy Chris were huge music fans. We get there, what was it? It was the witch hunt of the 80s. Oh yeah. All music is evil, backward messages, blah, blah, blah. And I sat and listened to him trash on this record and saying, oh, one of the people on this record has a 666 on him somewhere. And I studied this album cover like, no it doesn't. <laughs> There's no 666 anywhere on here. So are there occultic symbols? Yeah, probably. But uh, there was no 666. You know, the thing, and I know this has nothing to do with the music, but this is just my little take on this. Um, I mean, everybody knows that I'm a Christian. I've said it before in my videos, but why would you expect a, a band that's not Christians to have anything that's not... I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's just... Why would you expect it? I mean, it's, it's just... Uh, their just belief, like they're, it's a paranoid worldview. Yeah, their beliefs are your beliefs, so therefore, yeah, yeah, it's just... It's kind of bizarre that people... And it was tough, because that, that couple hours I spent in that Baptist church, it scarred me for a lot of years, because I was, I was young, I was impressionable, and yep. it just it, yeah, it stole some, of, some of the joy. I, I, I went to some of it just made me... You know what did for me? It made me more defiant, and I and actually discovered a few new bands. <laughs> the ones they hate, thank you for hipping us to the ones you hated, exactly. because those are the ones we love. Well, and my thing, oh, was, yeah. my thing was, what, what it was is, is also that... Um, they, they were saying a lot of things that you know, guys like you and me knew wasn't true, like Chris Knight and Satan service. Like, right? But but as what? a kid, I didn't have that that strength of personality yet to say, yeah. no, you're wrong. Right? Yeah, you, you authority figure, you're wrong, and, and that yeah. it still pisses me off because it stole some, it stole a lot of joy that it had music. Because okay. obviously, I wasn't completely disinterested in what they had to say, right? As a general rule, but anyway, I digress. If you, had, if you hadn't noticed from my past 50 videos. I have a bit of ADD. So to say. <laughs> we can get off What do you mean? Easy. Chicken! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Next we get up, off on it. one of my favorites that didn't make the top 10. Shocking, I know. Ted Nugent, Intensities, Intensities. An all live album with all new tracks, one cover song. Who does that? Nobody. <laughs> uh, you know, I know people disrespect this album a lot because they say it was, you know, him just getting out of his record contract. Whatever. It rocked, rocked my world. <laughs> rocked my world too, man. That, um, uh, I, I call Chuck Berry on steroids. Oh yeah, man. He just was all over it, man. Great put up or shut up. Yep. Love that cut. And he had a great guitar tone on this record too. Yep. That, that. And you know what? Nugent Live is something to behold, and they yep. captured something on here. They captured that raw energy. He's playing Bike Week out here this week. He's oh, going nice. to be playing next Friday night. Oh, uh, right world. Yep. I may go. I've never seen. Intensities, him. intensities. And I believe this was the last record for Epic Records. The last album for Epic Records. And the same lineup through. that was on State of Shock and Scream Dream. Correct. Yep. So there you go. Which I like. Uh, I do too. All right, Nugent. All right, we got part two in this Alice Cooper cocaine fueled trilogy. Yeah. <laughs> Which was Flush the Fashion in 1980, Special Forces in 1981, and then Zipper Catches Skin was the next one. Uh, I love this album. It's got that same kind of humor that Flush the Fashion had, and it's just, it's got more of that new wave flavor that was kind of the, you know, flavor of the month back in 1981. There's a couple rockers too, though. There are. Yeah. Um, geez. We got, a, we got a cover on here, Seven Seven Is, I think is a love cover. Yep. Um, Funny stuff. Prettiest cop on the block. There's a remake of Generation Landslide on here that's live. Uh, I like it. I, I like it a lot. Yeah. Um, oh, this even has "Look at You Over There" put ripping sawdust from my teddy bear on it. Yep. Which it may not actually be on here, but that was like a B-side or a, a bonus track later. Anyway, you know, it's funny thing is this is not one of Alice Cooper's more well-known, most liked records, but <laughs> the symbol on the back became one of his most. Memorable. I mean, everybody loves that symbol, and I think it's an awesome symbol. I actually, you see it? that? Ah, it's like a go. mirror. There you <laughs> go. Um, Skeletons in the closet. That's a cracker. I love that one. That's a great one. And there's also uh, you look good in rags. That's another one. Chris and I used to listen to this and just crack up. Great album. Good stuff. Fun. You know. Yep. Alice Thanks Cooper. Special Thanks Forces. Uh, this band uh, had actually released two albums prior to this one. Um, they were called Yesterday, Today, Oh yeah, Y&T, &T. and this is part of a trilogy of awesome albums. Yes. Um, but this was the first in the, in the batch. San Francisco Hard Rock, these guys ruled the scene before Metallica came along and changed the whole game. And mm. somehow this band just never caught, caught, caught on, I don't know why. Mm. I, moved, I moved out to the Bay Area right around that time, 83, and uh, I heard them on the radio and I was like, jeez, who is that? What a great band. And, 
They got a little bit bigger. They, the summertime girls yeah, was pretty big. Girls were pretty big hit. And so was, um, what was the other song that they had before that? Uh, mean Streak. Mean Streak, yeah. yeah. Mean Streak was. I remember hearing that one on like Metal Shop and stuff like that back yep. in the day. It's good so. stuff. I mean, Dave Manichetti, great singer, great blistering lead player. Um, we lost Phil Kenimore a couple years ago. A couple years ago, yeah. Bass player. Sad. I heard Leonard Hayes just rejoined them for something recently. The drummer, great drummer. Oh my god, Leonard Hayes. Some of his kick drum work. Killer rivals John Bonham really in some way. Oh, you, know. you, just, you just lost half the crowd right there. Shut up. <laughs> I love John Bonham. The guy obviously loved him. I mean, how can you be a drummer and not? Y&T, you're a shaker. Yes, sir. All right, here we have an album that was overlooked by most Kiss fans, including me, until after um, after Creatures of the Night came out, and I had a huge resurgence in my love for Kiss. Went back and revisited The Elder and realized, oh my god, this is a great record. Yeah, it's, it's different. It's it's Kiss's most progressive record, maybe, yep. like after Destroyer. And Bob Ezrin produced them both. Hmm, go and, figure. You know, I, and I hear people diss on this record all the time. And, I mean, and there's, I, there's some goofy stuff on yeah, it. Yeah. Odyssey's a little bit hard to take. It's a, personally. It's a concept record. It is. And I think it's one of the most intelligent things Kiss ever did. Yep. Hey, there's not a song on here about sex? That's amazing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But two of my all-time favorite KISS songs, Only You and Under the Rose, ah, they flow right into each other and they're epic songs. The Catchy stuff on there. The Oath is got a, it opens up with this blistering Mr. Blackwell, yep, I, stuff. Uh, Dark Light, Dark that's, Light that's Ace. Ace's contribution. That, and I mean, that song could have easily, if oh, it yeah. wasn't, I think it might have even been recorded for his solo album, like he was going to do it, but he actually had to have something for this week. And his other oh, contribution on this was Escape from the Island, which is an intro. Great song. Uh, yep, another uh, instrumental. instrumental. Yeah, instrumental. A, another jam. Uh, it was a jam that he did with Eric Carr, that which they call Car Jam, I think, on some yeah, bonus tracks. It was like that was the jam session that turned into Escape from the Island. So we got here uh, original. They had an original track running order that was more integral to the story, how it plays out in the album. Just a boy, Odyssey, Only You, Under the Rose. Yep. And then like was, it opens up with Fanfare, which is yeah, you know, that makes sense. Yeah. Fanfare is the opening. But then they changed it to be a more commercially viable track listing, which opened up with The Oath, which was the first one I had. And it's like, wow, it's a killer opening track. But it wasn't until later I realized the track listing had been tampered with. Tampered with changed. And then I also have the West German oh, pressing that had a little backwards, backwards Z's. Instead of the two S's that look like the Stormtruppen Stoldaten of the Nazis, they change it. Out of respect, I'm sure. I'll take this. All right, next. Uh, your turn. Yep. We got, uh, Quokka! Yes, sir. Ardwell. Yep. Uh, cool cover art. Yep. I mean, you can't get more metal than that, right? Nope. But, you got songs on here. Again, I kind of, like, this ha it kind of has, like, an ACDC groove. Um, not quite as much as one bite at a time, but... What do you got on here? Smelly Nelly, right? <laughs> Smelly Nelly. <laughs> her, her, what is it? Something like her, her underwear is dirty, but her ass is paradise. It's like, wow. <laughs> wow! Gene we got Mr. 69 right there, too. How, how did Gene Simmons not write that song? I don't know. Maybe he did. Maybe he did. <laughs> Easy Rocker. It's, you know, it's Easy a, Rocker's a great cut. Yeah. And Burning good. Bones, great yep. opener. It's a good stick. It's a good album. I, I still, I think they got better with each album, really. And then one My mom like, keeps calling me and texting and interrupting. Sorry. Like one Vice <laughs> at a Time, definitely a, um, definitely the better record than this. And then Headhunter. Better than oh, that. Oh man. I mean, they, they just kept getting big. better. So. And then after Headhunter, they started getting worse. Yeah. <laughs> but they I mean, the Blitz, it out since, so. Blitz was commercially, you know, Midnight Maniac is probably their biggest song ever, but uh, for us who grew up with this stuff, this stuff yeah. it wasn't Crocus. No, I, it wasn't my thing. But we all, we all kind of had to swallow that mid 80s anyway. All right, oh boy, this is a killer record. Joe Perry Project, his second solo work. Yep. Look at the rock and rolls again. This is just one of those records that some I don't know about you, but there's just sometimes records that you just you saw them coming out and you're just like I need this record. Yep. I bought it. Never heard. Out. Yep. Never heard a thing on it. I mean, I knew it was Joe Perry of Aerosmith. That was my so, thing. Yeah, you know, I'm the Aerosmith fan. You guys know that. So, but this record, man, it is solid. Now, through and through. Do you think it's as good as Leather? Uh, the music to the talking. I prefer this one. They, personally, I prefer this one as the first one I heard. Yep. So I got used to the sound on this one, and then Let the Music Do the Talking has such a different sound. Okay. See, for me, it was just the opposite. I, I bought Let the, music, you know, Let the Music Do the Talking as a new release, loved it, yeah. bought this one, and I still love this one too, but the, 
it, you know, nostalgia, what you hear first. Oh yeah, totally. It's like the Diamond Head thing. Like, yep. I heard Borrowed Time first, so it's not, I don't like it as much as Lightning to the Nations. Some people think that's blasphemy, it's like, well, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever got there first tends to make it an imprint. Exactly. You know? So this this is not a bad song on here. So that's this was the you know the fallout from Aerosmith falling apart in the seventies second album. But there was also with St. Holmes, Holmes. Like one. Yep. So you got uh, Derek St. Holmes from Ted Nugent. Um, you know he was an integral part of those early Ted Nugent records. Yep. Um, but he wasn't the alpha male. No. Nugent was the alpha male, and uh, so he splintered off and got together with Brad Whitford. And really, same thing. Out. I mean, Terry was definitely the alpha in Aerosmith as far as the guitar duo. But Whitford's a great guitar player. Oh yeah, he's probably. And I've even, I've even yeah. heard Joe Perry say, you know, he praised Brad Whitford being a better guitar player than him. Berkeley graduate, I think. What, was he a better guitar player? I don't know. Technically, probably he Maybe. was. But it's all about feel. You like know? all that, all that real heavy stuff, like nobody's fault stuff, and yeah. sharp, and round and round. That was all Brad. Brad, yep. That was totally but, Brad. But you know, I mean, it's heavy metal, hard rock. It's not always about technique. No, nope. it's all it's about feel. Yeah. And Joe so had the Joe attitude. had the attitude in this totally. video, yep. And the same thing with Ted Nugent, you know. Yeah, hard to compete with Ted Nugent. It was all he had the attitude, and yeah. you know Joe Perry. I mean, he said it all before, and I won't repeat Nugent's exact words, but it's all about the attitude. Yep, I left out the expletive. <laughs> so there you go, two albums from Aerosmith members, um, ex Aerosmith members who of course stuff. rejoined them. Yeah. Both ex. This is a little more commercial. This one. This is a little more guitar oriented, hard yeah. rock, which fit in with uh, who else? Is it? I mean, just that guitar-heavy rock and roll. I mean, maybe like you know, Robin Trower or yep. uh, not very Hendrixy, but still. I mean, it, it goes up against any Aerosmith record, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, um, 70s Aerosmith, Van Halen. That not quite the guitar pyrotechnics of Van Halen, but it's all that just real hard, the hardest of the hard rock at the time. Exactly. And this one's definitely more melodic, more mainstream. Um, you know, Derek Sinclair's got that real smooth voice. So. Yeah. Great record. stuff. Great stuff. Aerosmith. All right, what's next? Uh, uh, next up. All right, this is one. Um, I'll be honest. This is one I'm fairly new to. Uh, just in the last few years, I'm a, I was a huge fan of Helix in the '80s, but uh, black, white, black lace. Let's try one more time. White lace, black leather, Helix. This is their first album, independent re uh, release. And there's Brian Vaughn. Wow, he doesn't look anything like he used to, or like he did later. Wait, this is their you know what? I'm wrong. This is their second album. Oh, okay. Second album. So um, this was before. This is the Rock they had, You and Heavy Metal Love. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. This is a. Uh, this was their second album. My apologies. Their first album was called Breaking Loose. Had the chains that was came okay. apart. Both of them were uh, on the independent H H and S Records. Canadian um, band, right? Canadian band. Yep. yep. Um, this uh, yeah, it doesn't look different than you know what you think of when you think of Helix. There's no you know, 80s heavy metal anthems on here. Um, but it was it was a crossover record because you had that Breaking Loose, which was definitely had a 70s vibe, and it crossed over to that kind of 80s sound, and that's kind of where this is, right in the middle of the two. Yep. Uh, solid record. Yeah. I, I love that photo, Brian Bomber. Just, that's a great photo. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And anyway, mustache. This is a bit of a hard one to find. So. Um, there you go. Excuse Felix. me. All right. So next up, we've got Rainbow. Richie Blackmore. Yes, and I believe this was the. It was a grand bonnet? Debut for, no, this is uh, Joel and Turner. Joel I think Turner, was the first okay. one he sang on. And I've got the Jealous Lover 12 inch on this one. Did not include it on this album. Let me see. I think the song Jealous Lover was included, but it's all the extra nope. songs, right? No. Nope. Jealous Lover's not on here. But it does have uh, it Can't Happen Here and I Surrender the B sides, which are, are on, on the album. Here. Okay. And there's an instrumental called White Vice Time. Vice Time. It's, um, it's Jealous Lover and Vice Time were, were new tracks. Um, this Rainbow album, really good stuff. I always really dug Joel and Turner because that was the first Rainbow stuff I heard, believe it or not. Uh, Straight Between the Eyes, the first Rainbow album I ever heard. I never heard the Dio stuff till later. See, and I was a huge fan of the Dio stuff, so when I kind of heard this for the first time, I was like, what the heck is yeah. that? Yeah. It didn't have that same almost medieval uh, dark sound. It was much, it's more, much more upbeat, right. much more, I don't want to say poppy, but commercially viable maybe yeah yeah a little bit more accessible but um, this is I surrender was a, was a big track on this uh, written by Russ Ballard of Argent yep um, <clears throat> he's written a lot of songs Ace Fraley has covered songs by him into the night New York groove that's all Russ Ballard stuff great great songwriter so not really surprising uh, can't happen here was another great one uh, well known and then we got difficult to cure which is Be Beethoven's ninth Sym symphony done by Richie Blackmore on guitar 
Uh, not the whole thing, obviously, but a good portion of it. Um, good stuff. Really good stuff. Jealous Lover is a great cut, too, so it's, it's a nice little uh, companion EP to go with this. All right, so up next is the um, second full-length album for a new wave of British heavy metal band, The Girl School. Yeah. Um, cool cover art. Love that one. Uh, I don't know. First I, one I ever heard, actually. I tend to like the first album better. It's a little raw. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it's raw or it's got... This one has better production, that's all there is to it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, a lot of the charm of those early New Wave of British heavy metal bands was that raw, nasty, almost live production. This this probably my favorite Girl School album. It's got Hit and Run, uh, Race with the Devil, which Race is that, Devil, that yeah. gun cover again. So you did on the first, first album, album, too. too yeah. yeah, right. I love that one. Yeah. Uh, Come On, Let's Go is a great one. The Hunter's Great. Kick It Down is probably my favorite Girl School song. Yeah. And you Hands can't, down. You great really can't go deep with the first two albums. Nope. Yeah. Really good. I'm stuff. really kind of surprised they didn't get bigger. But I guess it was because they, they actually tried to go down a more commercial route after this that they kind of lost their core fan base. Yeah, then Screaming Blue Murder, which is still pretty heavy. Pretty good, yeah. And then Play Dirty, which got which some had, got some MTV. And then they playing. had some they had members leaving and coming and going. And, True. So yeah. yeah. Yammering on awesome. school. All right, we getting deeper into classic rock area here. Rush moving mm -hmm. pictures. Jeez, not very classic here, is it? And um. <laughs> Wow, side one. I mean, if you don't know the songs on side one, you've been living under a rock. Tom Sawyer, Red Barchetta, YYZ, and Limelight. I mean, oh, yep. <laughs> great tracks. Yeah, jeez. I just saw them in 2011 in Canada, uh, Hamilton, Ontario, Neil Peart's hometown. Uh, they did the whole. It was the 30th anniversary of Moving Pictures. They did the whole album, and it sounded awesome. Awesome. Um, again, Rush has got their. The way that they do their cover artwork, this layered yeah. means. Moving it's, pictures. Okay, we got moving guys, moving portraits, like pictures of art. And the, the pictures are very moving to the bystanders because they're crying. And that's not it. I mean, on the back, they've got a film crew moving pictures. It's just multi levels of meaning, and that's Neil Peart, really. That's, that's one of those things you, I, you listen to the record and you're just staring at it the whole time. Oh, totally. Trying to find new stuff in it, you know? Yep. This, this album, to me, re represents the end of an era for Rush. Oh, for sure. Um, this was the last time I would describe as hard and heavy. You know, after yeah. that, it became more... I mean, keyboards keyboard. got introduced more, they were more prominent I mean, there was when keyboards signals on this, came out. But it was yeah, different, you know? It, was different. it still had that growling bass, that, yep. that Rickenbacker bass that kind of disappeared on, on follow-up albums. But. Yeah, definitely end of an era. I, I, did a, I did a compilation called Antediluvia, which is like, that means like the pre-flood world, I mean the great flood in the Bible. Um, cuts from this on it. Uh, there was these like, from like 80 to maybe 85, there was like the last hurrah of those really big classic rock bands and definitely this is one of them. A lot of those bands put out like, some of them put out their final albums and definitely their final successful ones during that period, the way I see it. Um, they were included in that for sure, but Rush never really, they had albums that were more successful than others, but geez, everything they put out is like the highest quality attainable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a great bunch of musicians. Sometimes they're so damn smart they just piss me off, but I still like them. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, this next band oh, is. Boy. We play rock and roll. We are Motorhead. Motorhead. Live at Hammersmith. Live at Hammersmith. Classic. Classic. I mean, it's, if you had to recommend one Motorhead album, probably this one. It's a, this would be great. If you don't know who Motorhead is, great introduction right here. Yep, and the classic I mean, lineup. Motorhead is raw, nasty, gnarly. I mean, it's, it Rock just and is. And of course, this is still the original, the classic lineup. It's not just the original lineup, but the classic lineup. Yeah. yeah. So you got Fast Eddie Clark and, uh, you know, Phil Taylor, Phil Taylor and, and Lemmy. I mean, Lemmy. Lemmy's a constant. No Lemmy, no Motorhead, really. He's grown. Some, some artists grow their band, it becomes them. It's just. Yeah. Like so. But this is the original. This is a. Uh, and, and they capture a raw energy here oh, totally. that you can't capture on a studio record. Yep. You know? um, and Great this is. stuff. I, I, I always say that live records end of an era, but not really, because Iron Fist came after this, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, they, and uh, they, I mean, Motorhead's one of those bands, you know what you're going to get. It's like yeah. ACDC, so you pretty much know what you're going to get. With Motorhead, you always know it's going to be good. If you like their sound, there's not an album you can buy that you're not going to like. And again, I always love the cover art on this one. Oh, yeah. And like, I think this was when they retired the bomber, too. Yeah, and I would have I would have loved to have seen you know, them during those days. But. Yeah. I, saw the, I mean, the current lineup is probably the, the most, the one with the most longevity. Yeah, I mean, I've seen it probably like ten times, you know, with recent lineups, but never saw that original lineup. I've seen it twice. So I don't know how I managed to do that. <laughs> I did see him with the Filthy Animal Teller once. Oh, nice. So, but with Wurzel and Phil Campbell. Yes, nice. That's a cool lineup. Too. Yep. Penny Arcade and Rochester Wurzel. Wurzel died a few years ago too. Yeah, he did. Yeah. 
did. So, all right, you might hear this one playing in the background. We've got uh, UFO, Wild, the Willing, and the Innocent, the second album from the Paul Chapman lineup. Great stuff. Uh, got the UK cover here and the US one. UK cover is kind of cool because on the back you get, you know, on the front we got the guy kind of looks like he's giving the girl a tattoo with a blowtorch. It's just like, oh, typical UFO Scorpions type cover. I bet it's hypnosis. I bet it is too. It is. It's yep. hypnosis. They're just famous for that. On the back, in the UK cover, you got the girl and she's sporting her new tattoo, but. Ooh, look at that. I get some underboob up there. Very, very <laughs> Under, sexy. Underboob. <laughs> and here you just get this it. one. It's it's very it's very uh, it's uh, obscure. You yeah, can't it's... really tell. The, the UK cover. Obviously, we got a little bit more sexual liberal viewpoints over there. So, yeah, another classic record from them. Oh yeah. I, I mean, people dismiss them because it wasn't Shanker, but you know what? Yeah. Favorite cut on here? Long Gone. If you never heard Long Gone by UFO, look it up on YouTube. Oh my god. Yep. Check it out. <laughs> it goes up against anything. It's Killing Me is another one of my favorite cuts on here. Making Moves. Uh, couldn't get it right, which is playing right now. Great. Change Change is another great one. Just great. Great record. UFO. Can't go wrong. Can't go wrong. Are we up to our top five? No, we're not even close. <laughs> I don't have any records left. <laughs> oh, well, I got plenty, so I'll pass them over to you. All right. All right, so we are not even close to being top five. So we are at, uh, this is um, a band who had a huge influence in the new wave of British heavy metal, but we're actually an American band. Yep. Riot. Riot. And this would be the last album for Guy okay. Speranza. There you go. Last album for Guy Speranza. He died he passed several years ago. Yeah, many, many years ago. So, um, <clears throat> great record. I mean, there's just, how many, we're talking about so many of these guys who died. I know, it's sad. Within the last decade. Yeah. But anyhow, uh, solid heavy metal record. Oh yeah. Just kind of, you know, I, I would describe it as straightforward, almost biker rock. You know, yeah. just just <laughs> New York band too. <laughs> yeah. New York rock. Um, Swords and Tequila. It's really anthemic. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's probably one of their most well-known songs. Yeah. Probably right a signature song for them, really. And then the, the front cover, you've got the, you know, the mighty Tior, Tior or Johnny, as or the band actually calls him. And what the hell is he? He's some kind of baby kind of seal. seal or something. I don't know. Sometimes he wields but, an axe. Sometimes he's. A schoolboy turning into the baby seal. And here I have just, no idea. And here he's just a seal floating on top of some great pink looking skin body thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Doesn't I, think matter. It's his, I think he's an angel. Right. But these guys were actually, you know, gaining huge ground. I remember seeing like back in the internet all the magazines you buy back in the day, you see they were playing all over Europe yep. and, and they just know, never quite Never caught on here. Wait a minute, Mark Reale just died recently too, didn't he? Yes, he did. So without, I mean, Mark Reale was like the heart and soul of Riot. But Riot's still traveling on without him. Um, Are they? Riot Five? They released the, they they the album without him. Um, Is there yeah. anybody from the original lineup even still there? No, nobody. I don't think. Could be wrong. So odd. I have obviously. to check. We didn't check that out. Yeah. Like, but Molly Atcher was the first one I realized that did that, and I'm so yeah. I had a hard time getting my head around it. You know, I, it was a gradual change. I kind of understand it. It's, it's a way to keep the music alive, memory alive. That's and that's kind of what, what's going on with Riot. Same thing happened with Thin Lizzy. I mean, yeah. I mean, sometimes a band will become a vessel, I guess. And you're right. It keeps yeah. the memory alive. It's just odd to me for some reason. All right. Uh, so next up, we've got. Um, mm -hmm. 